to gather as one family in our Father's home this morning. As you came in, you should have received your bulletin. If you can go ahead and take that out right now, we're going to take a moment. Uh, look in it. There's a lot that's happening over the next few weeks. We'll have announcements too, but it's a great resource for you to know what is going on. Also, inside you'll see um, that you have your connection card. If you can take that out now, we're going to take a moment, fill in our name, information, let us know if you're a first-time guest, returning guest, or regular attendee. And if you're joining us online today, let us know that you're there. Give a shout out to us. Let us know how we can be praying for you. Let us know that you are there with us and worshiping too. As the announcements come on, take a moment, fill in your information, and on the back side, those prayer requests. Let us know how we can lift you up in prayer this week. Good morning, New Life family. Here are this week's announcements. Have you ever had a question pop into your mind during one of Chris, uh, Pastor Chris's sermons and wanted to ask him but didn't know when? You will have that chance on January 30th, immediately after service. The new sermon series deals with questions many people have. You can ask follow-up questions or new questions that you may think of. Please join us for uh, questions with Pastor and Pizza. The winter small group sessions will begin the week of January 30th. A list of all the small groups um, you can participate in is in your worship folders this week. And a sign-up sheet will be out the week of January 16th. Small groups are a great way to grow in your walk with Christ and to be a part of His family. Tithes and offerings can be given through the Easy Tithe app. Or you can text the word GIVE to 315-325-8080. We also have an offering box located in the back of the sanctuary for your envelopes and connection cards. That is all for this week. Make it a great week. See you later. And just a reminder, today after we finish worship, we have a luncheon. Many women have been putting together delicious food for you. So we invite you to stay and we'll be also having a short meeting along with the luncheon. So please don't dash out, but rather enjoy some fellowship together. Let us stand as we enter into a time of prayer and worship. Heavenly Father, your children have gathered together in your home today. We ask that we set a, you help us set aside all the things that are going on in our minds so that we can focus on the most important thing, you. Send your spirit this morning, leading us where you want us to go as we lift up praise and adoration to you, our Father. 
We ask this in your name. Amen. There's a space every beating heart. There's a longing reaches past the stars. There's an answer every question mark. There's a name. There's a hope flowing through these veins. There's a voice echoes through the pain. There's an amber ready for the flame. There's a name. We will fix our eyes on the one who overcame. We will stand in awe of the one who breaks the chain. Love has a name. Love has a name. Jesus.
When the road runs dead, you can see a way I don't. And it makes no sense, but you say that's faith is for. When I see a flood, you see a promise. When I see a grave, you see a door. When I'm at my hand, you see where the future starts. I don't know how you make the way, but I know you will. I don't know how you make a way, but I know you will. Promise from Eden to Zion, every dead end, now to the grave. I don't know how you make a way, but I know you will. The world's on fire, it's like you don't have a plan. When the earth gives way, on the track you choose. I worship. 
worship you. I worship you. You are here, healing every life. I worship you. I worship you. You are here, turning lives around. I worship you. I worship Sing it out if you do. You are way maker, miracle work, promise keep, light in the darkness. just from the Old Testament or the New Testament. They are happening today in our lives, lives of our friends, lives of complete strangers. You work miracles. Nothing is too small for you because you are the way maker. Today, as we gather together and your spirit is moving, we ask that that spirit speak to us, that our hearts are open to your words. And as Pastor Chris comes, that the words he speaks are your words. That we may be changed and we may be your light in this world that needs to see some miracles, the miracle of your love. We ask this in your name. Amen and you may be seated. Thank you. 
Matthew 18, verses 23 to 35. Therefore, the kingdom of heaven may be compared to a king who wished to settle accounts with his servants. When he began to settle, one was brought to him who owed him 10,000 talents. And since he could not pay, his master ordered him to be sold with his wife and children and all that he had for payment to be made. The servant fell on his knees, imploring him, have patience with me and I will pay you everything. And out of pity for him, the master of that servant released him and forgave him the debt. But when that same servant went out, he found one of his fellow servants who owed him a hundred denarii, and seizing him, he began to choke him, saying, Pay what you owe. So his fellow servant fell down and pleaded with him, Have patience with me, and I will pay you. He refused and went and put him in prison, where he should pay the debt. When his fellow servants saw what had taken place, they were greatly distressed, and they went and reported to their master all that had taken place. Then his master summoned him and said to him, You wicked servant, I forgave you all that debt because you pleaded with me, and you should not and you and should not you have had mercy on your fellow servant as he had as I had mercy on you? And in anger his master delivered him to the jailers until he should pay all his debt. So also my heavenly Father will do to every one of you if you do not forgive your brother from your heart. This is God's word. Amen. Good morning, everyone. Nice to see everyone this morning. Nice to have both campuses together, isn't it? Don't worry, it'll get a little warmer in here. It's a big room. We'll get the heat blasting, so just hang in there uh, with us. Uh, this story uh, really speaks to my heart. Um, as an Italian-Irish guy from North Jersey, choking people for money is an in, in, it's kind of an in, in, you know, kind of a reflex for us to do that. That's a joke. You can laugh at it. It's okay. But this morning, we're continuing with our series on this idea of forgiveness. And these are questions that I get a lot. And these are questions that we're going through over the next number of weeks, questions that people pose me. And the one that we're looking at today is, how can I forgive? And most of us have experienced things in our lives that are incredibly painful, things that have hurt us to the core. Some of them happen in very formative years and some real recent. And what we, we, we want to talk about today and process with you today is this idea of forgiveness. Now, now, there's a, a TV show that's out there. It's kind of taken the world by storm. Apparently, they got 20 Emmy Awards for the program, which apparently is a lot in TV land. I don't know. But it's called Ted Lasso, if you haven't seen it. I do not recommend movies, and I do not recommend programs. Because, And by the way, do not sit the kids in the popcorn and go watch this. There's some things in there your kids probably shouldn't hear talked about. Okay, but in the program, it's very, very interesting. Uh, the premise of the program is it's a, it's a wealthy English couple who go through a divorce. And through the divorce, the woman gets hold or get full ownership of a um, English soccer or football team, as they, they call it. And she hates her husband for divorcing her. So what she wants to do is hurt the thing that he loves most, and it's this football or soccer team. So what she does is she hires an American football coach college football coach to come and coach the team. And what her hope is, is that he will destroy the team. Okay, you follow me so far? So he comes over and he's this ultra positive, really nice guy. And she is undercutting him all the time. See, she's sabotaging everything he does. He tries to, you know, he, he tries to help someone out and she has, has a uh, a reporter follow him around whenever he trips up, he writes it in the paper. Or he has a photographer make scandalous, uh, an innocent thing look scandalous. And then he's trying to get a player to stay on the team and she trades him away. And he just is real positive about it. And the woman finally is just overcome with the way she's been treating him. And she goes down into his office. And his name is Ted Lasso. And she goes, Ted, I, I, I need to talk to you about something. And he's like, what? And she's like, I'm an awful person. And he's like, well, that's news to me. And he's like, you don't understand. She's like, you don't understand. I hired you to fail. I brought you over here from the United States to fail. My husband loves this team, and there's nothing I want to do more than to destroy it. And she says, and I, I, under I sabotaged everything you did. And she lists off a litany of things that she did. And he's like, okay, okay. And she's like, I'm, I'm sorry. And he looks at her and he's, tell 
he's really hurt. And he's kind of weighing what she said. And you can tell he's going through the emotions of all the pain that caused him. And he goes, I forgive you. And he stands up and they have a little dialogue. And he puts out his hand to her. And he says, put it there. We're okay. You and I are okay. Well, she's just blown away by the fact that this guy's forgiven her. She hugs him. And she's like, thank you so much for doing that. And he goes, you know, I think if two people have just a little bit of love, if they care for each other just a little bit, they could get through almost anything together. And he said to her, he goes, you want to know what? Divorce is a really hard thing. And that's what you're going through. And hard things make us, make us do crazy things. So we're all good. And she leaves and she goes and she talks to her, her assistant. And you know, they're thinking he's gonna quit. They're thinking, they're thinking the worst. And so the assistant's like, Did you talk to Ted? And she's like, Yeah, and he, and, and he's like, Well, what did he do? And she's like, You won't believe it, he forgave me. And the guy's like, the nerve of him. How dare he forgive you? And that is how obscure. That is how strange the idea of true forgiveness it is, is outside the church wall. By the way, forgiveness is even difficult and strange and kind of obsolete even inside the, 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 the church doors. And the message that we have of the gospel is a message that comes along with it of forgiveness and reconciliation. And this is something that we as Christians carry to the world and something that we're going to want to process to today. And as we process through these questions, I'll tell you, this is the hardest one. This is the one that gets down really deep with who we are. This gets down to really deep where who we are as Christians. So as you came in, you got a fill in the blank outline there. Why don't you take a look at there? And we're going to see our first fill in the blank is why forgiveness is an imperative. Forgiveness for Christians, it is an imperative. And you see it here in this passage where here this, this king forgives one of his underlords, one of his, it says it's a servant there, he's like a governor, and forgives him. And then you see that guy goes out, the forgiven person, and he is an unforgiver. And the king is furious. And he goes, guess what? You don't do that, that's not going to happen to you. And most of us, we, we, we look at this passage and we're like, um... So if I don't forgive, I'm not forgiven. So if I don't forgive people, God's not going to forgive me. And if you look at it that way, it kind of says, well, salvation isn't about what Jesus did, it does. What you need to do is forgive. That's not what that passage is saying. We need to understand what's going on here. Because very often you, 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 you tell people or you hear from the, from the church, you have to forgive. And if you don't forgive, God's going to forgive you. Like God's up there going, you didn't forgive, I'm going to nuke you. That's not what this passage is saying. If you go further on in the Gospel of Matthew, you get to Matthew 25, and Jesus starts talking about this idea where he separates the sheep from the goats. And he says to them, to the sheep, because you have done these things, because you have, you have, you have taken care of uh, those who are hungry, those who are thirsty, you visited those who were in jail, those who were basically what we call homeless, those who didn't have clothes, you clothed them. Because you did that, you get into heaven. So now only do we, we have to forgive to, to, to um, avoid hell. We've got to do this stuff to get into heaven. That's not what it's saying. Because then it goes on and it says, because you didn't do that to those, you didn't do it to me. Because you didn't show mercy to those people, you need to understand it's a tell that you haven't received mercy from me. And if you back that chapter 25 parable up to 12, what, what God is saying and what Jesus is saying there is because you're not forgiving them, it is a tell that you probably haven't received forgiveness from God. It's not you do this and you get this. No, it's because you're not doing this, you probably haven't received this. It's a tell. Forgiveness is an imperative because it lets us know where our heart is. God says, don't be fooled. Be very careful. 
when your heart is closed to others, your heart is probably closed to me. And if you're having trouble forgiving others, you need to get a greater understanding of what I have forgiven you. You see the difference? Nobody shook their head yes. It looks like, okay, yes, that's as clear as mud, Pastor. Don't worry. You can re-see it on the video and write me an email if you need some help. But not, is your next film, not showing mercy means we haven't received mercy. You can't give what you don't have. And when you receive mercy, you want to give it away. And a sign that we've received grace is that we're graceful. We give grace to others. And if you're not a forgiving person, you're not going to want to hang out with forgiving people. Now, don't hear what I'm not saying. Justice is important. Justice is important. I'm not saying let's let every wicked person get away with everything. I'm not saying that at all. But when you hang out with forgiving people, they look, because they have mercy, to be merciful. Now, I grew up in a place, you know, where uh, revenge is a dish best served cold. Vendetta is something that we look forward to. We wrung our hands going, when can we, when can we settle this? But when I became a Christian, I began to realize, wait a minute, there's a lot more in that. There's a lot more going on in my heart when I harbor those kind of things. And Christian people, what happens to them is they, that all that angst and all that anger and all that bitterness, it, it's just not there. So when you would talk about things like that, you were the odd guy out. That's why if, 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 if you don't practice forgiveness, heaven is going to be hell for you. What are you going to talk about? People who don't forgive always talk about those who don't, they haven't forgiven. People who don't forgive give up tremendous amounts of mental real estate to those they haven't forgiven. And people who have forgiven, they've, they've got on with it. They've, they've moved, it's not something that's always running in their mind. The pain isn't as acute as it was when they first, they first happened. Yes, we need to process things together, but it's not consuming. And we need to be very careful about that. Because as our natural being loves religion, our natural being, our fallen being, loves unforgiveness. Because when we practice unforgiveness, what happens is we view we're better than everybody. And when we practice unforgiveness, you know who we're imitating? Satan. Guess what? When we practice unforgiveness, we're becoming like him. Because we, does what, we do what he does. He doesn't practice mercy. He wants judgment. What is forgiveness? And this is your next one. Like, forgiveness is, and I, I kind of took the verse and I, I used the revised version of it, and it says, and the Lord... Uh, of that servant, being moved with compassion, released him and forgave him the debt. You see, there's three things that that king or that lord did. The first thing he did, he was moved with compassion. And this is what forgiveness does. Is there something that, ha that happens in our heart? That word, moved with compassion, it's not nearly as sappy as it sounds. It means there's an element of pity or there's a recognition that our heart is moved towards that person. When somebody does something to me and it hurts me and, and, and I, get, I, I usually respond with anger, but then what happens is my heart begins to be moved with compassion. My heart begins to check that person and have an element of pity on that person. And what happens is phrases like, I would never do that. Or I would never do such a thing. And a lot of those things are true, but very often I go, boy, if you take God out of my life, you put me in the right situation, I might not do that, but I could do some pretty bad stuff. I might even do that. And there our heart begins to be changed. It begins to show mercy. It begins to show 
an element of compassion. But what we often try to do is insulate our hearts from that person that we're not, that we don't want to forgive. Is we want to draw distance between us and them, and we want to hold on to that unfor unforgiveness. We want to hold on to that offense, and we want to we want to we want to exact our pound of flesh from that other person. And what we often do to keep ourselves from our heart being moved towards that person is we begin to insulate ourselves. And the first thing that we often do is we exclude them from the community of the humans. We say those people aren't being human; they're monsters. And then what we do is we exclude ourselves from the community of sinners. I'd never do anything like that. Now, I'm a horrible driver. I grew up com commuting outside of New York City to work. It's like death rate, death rates 2,000 every day. If I cut that person off, it's like a point system. 20 points today. And, and driving to work is, you're just aggressive. Aggressive driving. And I used to be a hot, I used to wear my horn out before my brakes. I mean, I just was terrible. And moving up to the country, I was the guy in town who honked his horn and everything. And as we drive around here, you know, it's, it's really funny. I, yeah, I'll be driving and someone will pass me and cut me off. And I always say to my wife, I never do anything like that. I used to do that five times a day. And if you're lucky, you'll catch me. I, I might do it to you one day. I really got to pray over that kind of stuff. But what happens is I used to be like, oh, I would never do that. Oh, yeah, I did it four times earlier today. And people do things to us and we say, oh, I'd never do well, in certain situations, we might. Now, there are situations where we would never do that. But when our heart begins to move, what happens is we begin to bring these people back and realize they're human. And we be begin to bring ourselves back and we begin to realize that we're sinners. And what happens with that is we start realizing that we're not better. We're just really blessed. We're blessed. We're not better. Now, I know this is a difficult situation now because certain people feel guilty about certain things and, 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 and everything like that. But I remember just a number of years ago, I, ha I was going to make a career move. And I was going to have to uh, you know, leave a career and move into another one. And I mentioned it to, to, my, to my brother. And I was like, you know what? I, yeah, I, I've, got, I've got to make a career. I might have to make a career move. And my brother said, if you need a place to stay, i got a vacation home. You can use it. Right there, the burden of where am I going to move my family is taken away from me. Then he went and told my dad, and my dad said the same exact thing to me. And I was like, boy, there are people who are stuck in careers. They can't make a career move because they have no place to put their families temporarily. I had two places I could just move in, rent-free. And I said to Amy, man, am I blessed. I didn't do anything to earn that. I didn't do anything to earn my dad or, or my brother. Yeah, I'm a pretty nice guy, and I foster, you know, our relationship and, and the, you know, work out our relationships. But I didn't, I didn't do anything for that. I'm just blessed. And very often, when we see people and we 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 bring the we we bring them into the community of humanity and we bring ourselves into the community of sinners, very often we see that we're not better, we're just more blessed. We're just blessed. We really start to see what we have. How we're standing on the shoulders of those who went before us. How there's networks around us that we are part of, that some people aren't. So what we often do to insulate people where our, heart aren't, 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 our hearts aren't moved from, towards them is we exclude them from the community of, of humans and we exclude ourselves from the community of sinners. Next, what we do is we often make characters of them. Like when I was a kid, we'd, we'd go down to the Jersey Shore and we'd walk down the boardwalk and there were these guys there and they'd, they'd make characters of you and stuff like that. And for some reason, every time they did one of me, I had a really big forehead. I had like a five head. Then I realized the reason why they did it is because I had a big forehead. But when someone makes a cartoon of you, they have to take aspects that are true and accentuate them. You ever see a cartoon of Prince Charles? What's he always have? A real pointy nose like Pinocchio and really big ears. He does. And you go, eh, that's, that's Prince Charles, look at him. And, and, that, and that's what happens what, with people. And what we do with people is when we need to insulate ourselves from them, we make cartoons or characters of them. We explode things out in their personalities or the way that they act. Someone who lied becomes a liar. Someone who stole something becomes a thief. Someone who didn't treat you nice becomes a jerk. 
and we turn them into a cartoon character of who they are. We take certain aspects of their personality or certain aspects of their traits and we balloon them out. We make characters of them. And then what we do is we objectify them. This is three. So we turn them into a thing. We call them names. We give them certain titles. And we slowly dehumanize them so they become an object. They become just a thing. They're no longer a human. The Nazis did this to the Jewish community. They made pictures of them. They wrote things about them. They said things about them. And then they objectified them. They're not even human, and they've called them a bunch of rats. And it let them become exterminators. But in order for us to forgive, we have to fight that desire in us to objectify, that we have to fight that, exot, that, that desire in us to characterize or to insulate people or to remove them from humanity. We need to fight against that. And we need to feel it going on inside of our hearts because it's so deceptive. Realize you can only be mad and unforgiving towards someone as long as you feel superior to them. And what this idea of our heart being moved is we realize that we're both human, we're both sinners, and we both have capabilities to do really bad things. Now, there are people out there that have done things that I don't think uh, most people in this room would ever do. And I'm not saying, you know, justice is just throwing the gate, you know, letting everything go. No, I'm not saying that at all. But what happens in our heart is we... Let God deal with our heart where that angst, that anger, that bitterness is no longer present. So forgiveness is this idea of being moved to compassion. Next, it's he release that person. And, you know, when we're harboring unforgiveness towards someone, we think that we have them in captivity. Actually, they have us in captivity. I mean, you ever have unforgiveness towards somebody and you hear they have a good day? Someone at work? You're like, the world's unjust. They should have terrible days. And then when they finally have a bad day, you're like, yeah, I have a good day. And you look up to God, you're like, okay, good. You finally saw what happened and now they're getting their comeuppance. We're not, in, we're not holding them in captivity. They're holding us into captivity. Unforgiveness is a poison you drink holding the other person die. And we need to be willing to release those people. And we often hide that idea of releasing that person in good kind of ideas. Now, there was somebody who, who, who I worked with who hurt my wife and myself really deeply. And, and one thing hurting me, nothing hurting my wife. And by the way, you only have grace to, to take care of your offense, not someone else's. And what I would often do to this person, in the realm of justice and being honest so this person doesn't help other people, I, I would just look for opportunities to talk about what happened. And every time I did that, I knew when I was talking, I was rehashing it. And instead of the pain becoming less acute, it actually kind of stayed at the same level. And every time I rehashed it, it for me, because I was unforgiven, it was just like... It was happening all over again. And every time I had one of those conversations, though I say I was, you know, doing it for just reasons and to educate those people that they weren't hurt like I was, I was, I felt sorry. And I would often have to go back to God and say, boy, I, I shouldn't have went that far with that. But in real, in realization, what happened to me was I was just holding on forgiveness and letting it out. And it was polluting myself and those around me. What happens is justice is true. Justice needs to, be, needs to be sought after. But it's after we've released that person. Because if we don't do it, after we release them, our justice really is vengeance. And with that person, I'll tell you, for a number of years, I wanted vengeance. I wanted that person to feel the pain that he caused my wife and myself. I wanted, that, I wanted my pound of flesh. And though I could have said, I, yeah, I chose him, all that kind of stuff, in reality, I did not release that person. 
And when I would hear that that person was doing well and everything like that, I'd be like, God, are you listening to me? And justice, we can, I'll tell you, we can only really look towards justice and not vengeance when, our, when we release those people. When they're no longer taking up all this real estate in our thinking and in our hearts and minds. That's why it's so important that we do it. Is that we seek God to move in our hearts and then we seek God to release, to give us the ability to release those people. Because even though in those situations I was telling the truth, there was so much pain and gas behind what I was saying, it was just proof. So we need to release them and then we need to forgive them the debt. Now, when you read this parable, as it was read in Matthew 18, what we see here is that the size of the debt is, is really what's key there. Okay, the, this ruler, this king gives up 10,000 talents. Okay, 500 talents are saying is worth hundreds of billions of dollars. So this is a huge sum of money. And when you look at a servant, this isn't like a butler. This is probably like a governor serving under a king or, you know, um, someone who's uh, in, in, in a governmental uh, position of, of some kind, a prefect or, or whatever. And, and he goes after getting, you know, hundreds or millions or trillions of dollars uh, forgiven. He sees someone who owes a hundred denarii. Now that's not a small sum of money. The average person would would, uh, would earn 300 denarii a year. So it's a pretty substantial sum of money, but not compared to what he forgave. And what happens is he grabs the person and throws him in jail and chokes him and, and all those things. And you see that this is a king who's forgiving like a governor for either misappropriating or corrupting or for corruption. And the king forgives the debt. Now, what does that do to the king? The king says, okay, you know, um, you know I'm going to forgive the debt. Now, it, it, it greatly changed the relationship between the king and the servant. You deal with government. Government's not incredibly emotional. They, they, government functions under, you know, dots and dashes and, 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 and pennies and cents. And, and it's not, you know, with government, it's like what the mafia says. It's, it's, it's not personal, it's business. But in this situation, you see the relationship is changed. There's forgiveness. It's not just contractual. There's grace. Can you imagine other Governors and servants going, and wait a minute. This, this guy just forgave that debt. Think he'll forgive my debt if I mess up? And most of us want to look at God as just contractual. We don't, we don't, we don't want a personal God. When, when God starts forgiving us, when God starts bringing us close to him, what happens there? So we realize that our relationship is totally changed. We don't get justice from God. We get mercy. I'm in the process of uh, working with the IRS, which, you know, you want to talk about, you know, not personal business. I'm, and I'm working with the IRS. I'm working on a 501c3 for an organization I work with. So I'm sending out reams of paper, and they're asking me for stuff, and they're asking questions, and they, they assign a person from the IRS to this, to, to my file, through my application. And it's this woman from Memphis, Tennessee. And I get these calls, and, and you know, it's an IRS person, so I'm like, oh, you know, they come and audit me and take all my stuff, you know. I find out, you know, that I didn't pay taxes when I was 18 or something. So I'm, I'm talking to this person, and this woman is really nice. And... So, you know, we're, we're passing stuff. I need more information on this. Okay. And I spent some time, type it on out. At the third or fourth interaction, she goes, man, I, okay, if you get me this, I think we can see this through. And I'm like, this person's advocating for me. This is really wild. Last week, I get a call. You're good to go. And I'm like, really? She goes, I just want to call you. I'm going to pass it up to my boss. 
And you know what? I'm so, I'm so happy that this is going through. She goes, I think what you're doing with this organization is awesome. I wish you were in Tennessee. I would sign my kids up for it and stuff like that. And I was like, this person works for the IRS. And she's got a heart. <laughs> I'm like, I didn't know these people existed. I thought they were like robots who just went, and I, and I, you know. You know? And, and my, whole, my whole idea, it was like, oh, really? Thank you so much. And imagine what goes on. Here's this governor goes to the king, and the king's like, hey, man, I'll take care of that for you. That's why it's so important for us that our faith goes from this kind of generic, you know, it's business, not personal, to it becomes personal. Now, it's not just personal, but it is personal. We need to know that we know that God forgave you and me. It's not enough for us to know that God died for the sins of the world. We need to know that he died for your sins and he died for my sins. Because when God does that, like this relationship, the whole dynamic changes. It goes from numbers and dots and dashes to personal. The pain, the fear that this person must have felt Fortunately, it was very short-lived, you see. So forgiveness, you need to see, forgiving that debt changed the relationship, but it also cost the king. The king didn't go, okay. It cost the king that much. And the servant knew that. Forgiveness cost God. What did our forgiveness cost our God? Okay, I'll make it easy for you. What did forgiveness cost Muhammad? What did forgiveness cost Buddha? What did forgiveness cost Moses? What did it cost our God? How did God create the cosmos? How did God create the universe? He said, let there be light and it was. How did God create the earth? He heard it. He spoke it. How did God create the moon and the stars and the sun? He spoke them. How did he create the animals? He spoke them. How did he create us? He got a little bit down in the dirt with us and he made us and then he breathed in us. How did he forgive us? Oh, I know what he did. He went like this to the stars and the moon. He said, hey! We're good. I forgive you. Nope. What did it cost him? Words. It cost him his very son. And we know the story. He came down to earth. He did what we could never. And he became us. He died for us. No one thing has a God that's done that. That's what it cost God to forgive us. He became us. Made himself killable. And he killed us. He didn't just yell it out in midair. It cost him everything. And that's why it's so hard for us. This is no joke. Forgiveness isn't just something that, oh, you just go, no, it's hard. It was hard for God, by the way. What does it cost your God to forgive you? Look at the other thing. It costs him many things. It costs our God everything. The next fill in the blank is we need help in this. This isn't something that just a sermon can take care of. And by the way, sermons just can't take care of a lot of things, by the way. We need help. We need help from our church. This is why church is so important. 
We need to be around people who are forgiving. And some of you have been called on by God to forgive people for things that I haven't even gotten close to. And when I hear your story, I go home and I go, God, how can I pastor these people? They know elements of grace that I haven't even, they know neighborhoods of grace I haven't even come close to entering yet. And we need each other, we need each other to encourage one another. Paul says in Corinthians that you comfort the way you've been comforted. And some of you don't understand, but your testimonies bring comfort to me and make me better at being a gospel Christian. And then we need help from Jesus, our King. The debt to others that we've incurred to, to, on us, they're painful. They're, 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 some of you have gone through things, I, I can't even imagine the pain. But the debt that we've had towards God is so much more than even that. And we need help from Jesus Christ himself to forgive. You do. You cannot do it on your own. Now, preparing this, I heard Tim Keller read this story, so I'm going to read it to you, and I don't normally do this, but I'm going to do it at this time. It's a story about Corey Tinboom, who have, was, her family was captured during World War II. They were harboring uh, Jews in, and, um, in Holland, and they were taken prisoner. And she, she watched her sister Betsy die in um, a Ravensbrück camp. And she had gone on uh, to do what Betsy told her to do, is to go out and tell people what they learned through this tragic situation. And this is what she writes. Corey herself was put to the test in 1947 and speaking in a Munich church. At the close of the service, a balding man in a gray overcoat stepped forward to greet her. Corey froze. She knew this man well. He'd been, on the, the most, been one of the most vicious guards at Ravenbrook, one who had mocked the woman prisoners as they showered. It came back with a rush, she wrote. The huge room with its harsh overhead lights, the pathetic pile of dresses and shoes, the center of the floor, the shame of walking naked past this man. And now he was pushing his hand out to shake hers and saying, a fine message, Caroline. How good it is to know, as you say, all sinners, all sins are at the bottom of the sea. And I, who had spoken so glibly of forgiveness, fumbled in my pocketbook rather than to take his hand. He would not remember me, of course. How could he remember one prisoner over thousands of other women? But I remember him in a leather crop, swinging from his belt. I was face to face with one of my captors, and the blood se my blood seemed to freeze. You mentioned Ravens Brook in your talk, he was saying. I was a guard there, but since that time, he went on, I have become a Christian. I know that God has forgiven me for the cruel things I did there, but I would like to hear it from your lips as well. Caroline, again, he had his hand out to me. Will you forgive me? And I stood there. I, whose sins had been again and again forgiven, and could not forgive. Betsy had died in that place. Could he erase her slow, terrible death simply for asking? The soldier stood there expectantly, waiting for Corey to shake his hand. She wrestled with the difficult, the most difficult thing I had ever had done in my life. For I had to do it. I knew that. The message of God's forgiveness has a prior condition. That I was to forgive those who injured me. Standing there before a former SS man, where we remember that forgiveness is an act of the will, not an emotion. Jesus, help me, she prayed. I can't lift my hand. I can't do that much. You supply the feeling. Corey thrust out her hand. And as I did, an incredible thing took place. The current started in my shoulder, raced down my arm, sprang into our joined hands. 
then his healing warmth seemed to flood my whole being, bringing tears to my eyes. I forgive you, brother, I cried with all my heart. For as long, for a long moment, we grasped each other's hand, the former guard and the former prisoner. I had never known God's love so intensely as I did then. But even so, I realized it was not my love. I had tried, and it did not have its power. It was the power of the Holy Spirit. This is what the gospel does to our hearts. This is what the Holy Spirit does in our hearts when we're, our love is at our end. If we move forward in the power of the Holy Spirit, God can do incredible things in our lives and those around us. And as you came in, you had a connection card on the back or some fill in the blanks that go along with the sermon. Choose one of these for this coming week, and then we'll pray together. This week, I will ask God to forgive me and be Lord of my life. You know, maybe you're here and you kind of have just figured out what the gospel is, or the gospel just fell from your head to your heart. If that's you, um, check that one. Or maybe this is you. This week, I will ask God, help me to be moved with compassion for those who have, and that should be hurt me. Who have hurt me. That's you. Check that. And this week I will ask God, who do I need help to forgive? I don't think in the truest sense when it's really deep on our hearts that we can do it on our own like, like Corey Ten Boom said. We need the help of the Holy Spirit. So if you need God's help now, check that one and let's pray together. Lord Jesus, thank you for your goodness and your mercy. Thank you, Lord God, that you ask us sometimes to do hard things. You ask us, Lord, sometimes to lay down our rights, and our pain, and our desire for justice, and even our vengeance, so that we might receive your grace and your mercy and your love. Help us now, Lord God, as all of us yield with the idea of forgiveness. Help us to get beyond our pain and our anger and our desire to seek vengeance. But Lord, do a miraculous work in our heart, just like we heard you hear through our sister Corey. As we've chosen one of these next steps for this week, do something incredibly life-changing and profound in all of our lives. So we thank you, Lord God. We ask you to bless these next steps for this week. And now, Lord God, as we receive our offering, Lord, would you be blessed with this gift? give the leadership wisdom on how to be good stewards, and multiply and enable us, Lord God, to do your work and your bidding in our city and in our community. We pray this in Christ's name. Everyone said, amen. Amen. Let's receive our offering. Come. You pulled my heart from Egypt. You carved the road through the sea. All our chains to endless praise. Story ends with you. And when we cross that Jordan, look back at where we've been. All the chains you win this race. Story ends with you. Make a way, but I know you will. I don't know how you make a way, but I know. that your mercy, your grace, your Holy Spirit will go before us this week. Lord, go before us. Make a way for us to live in victory and enjoy with you. Undergird us when we need strength in your capacity. And Lord, always protect us and protect our back, we pray. We pray this in Christ's name. And everyone said, amen. Amen. God bless you. You're dismissed. No, you're not dismissed because we have some food for you. If you give us a few minutes, we...